Hi everyone, just a quick note about this episode's audio quality. I apologize because we had some challenges in recording our introduction and the interview itself. We're using some new audio recording equipment and we're in a new location and therefore we're still trying to figure things out. So thank you very much for your patience. That thumping sound you will hear during the interview, I believe, is some tapping on the table that was happening and the mic picked that up, of course. So it's my fault for not noticing it and stopping it. Again, thank you for your patience and hope you enjoyed this episode anyway. Hi, welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Michelle Molyneux. And I'm Greg Pang. Today's podcast is going to explore securities laws and what to be aware of when raising money for a project. But first, how have you been, Greg? What have you been up to this last month? I've been, I've been doing really, really well. I've uh, been very, very busy, a lot of changes on my end, and I think it's been at least a couple months since we've seen each other, right? So yes, yeah, yeah, you've been off of, on, your, on your own adventures, and I'm, I'm very envious of you. You were out uh, <laughs> on, the, on the West Coast, was that? Yes, I was. It was beautiful. Was it, hey? So, so you missed, like, guessing some of the coldest days that we had? I think so. <laughs> okay. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, because the last time we got together was uh, sometime in February, in, in the darkest of the months in, here in Edmonton, and, um, and and now it's, as of this recording, we're, we're in April, and at least things are starting to warm up here. Yeah, it's and nice and sunny out. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, now, and now we're ready to get back at it again. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what were what were you doing uh, over in the West Coast? Let's uh, let the listeners know about that. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've kind of moved to Vancouver, and I say kind of because obviously I'm sitting here recording with you today in right. Edmonton. But um, yeah, I've been uh, visiting friends and family this month and uh, spending some time with my palm chi pupper named Prince, which is really nice. Um, You can see pictures of him on my Instagram, in case anybody's curious. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so I've been back in Edmonton and I've been helping with uh, some production work and uh, most importantly, uh, shooting a music video in a couple weeks. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Whose music video? Um, So it's a song that I co-wrote and do backing vocals on. The song is All Night Long, and the artists are Jay Slay and Kelly Alana. Ooh, fantastic. Yeah, really excited. It's kind of like an EDM track, and we're just going to do a really, really fun, playful video. So. And you're shooting that soon? Yes. Yeah, um, going to be the 28th and 29th, I believe, our okay. shooting dates. So. Well, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, yeah. as for you know myself, like uh, I mentioned, a lot going on. Uh, we just moved offices, and here we are sitting in the new offices of Red Frame Law. Mm-hmm. Where, it's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. And uh, the, the particular room we're sitting in is the, we call it the music room. Mm-hmm. It, uh, we have a guitar in the corner there, and it's a nice quiet room where we can do this kind of recording um we could probably do uh, you know do a little bit of work with the acoustics in here a little bit echoey but not too bad hopefully it doesn't show up too bad in this recording here and and yeah so uh and my semester with my students has wrapped up um at the university so we gave them their final exam Ooh. and you know what's a good sign mm. and I, I i've never done this with my profs um after writing a final but several of my students came up and shook my hand after writing their final. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yes. I th- yeah, like uh, I remember being, you know, writing my final, being so exhausted. And all. And sometimes, you know, of course, if you don't study well, then you're kind of angry. So you don't. Last thing you want to do is shake your professor's hand, right? <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, that was that was pretty cool. And uh, now I kind of mark the finals. <laughs> so, oh. <yeah>, so, <laughs> so that's that, fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I would not describe it as fun, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, get that done, and uh, that's another semester under my belt, and uh, a lot going on with the practice as well, and a lot of new, exciting files um, I'm working on. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, yeah. So, uh, but here we go, and and of course, the podcast, as of today's recording, has officially launched. And it's so exciting! We're official. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we started recording like two months ago. We have a few hours, I think, of content mm-hmm. um, ready, but uh, we we had not launched officially until actually today, 
and because we were waiting for for iTunes to accept our submission. So mm. we're so happy. We're on Apple Podcasts now. Yeah. And we're on Spotify. We're on Google Play slash Podcasts. We're on Stitcher, uh, and we'll probably be on other platforms as well. So yeah. So there's multiple methods of uh, listening to us chat here mm-hmm. uh, on on your uh, podcast platform or catcher of choice. That's awesome. So do you want to tell the listeners, Greg, a little bit about the format of today's podcast? Sure. Today, yeah, as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is about securities law. And I thought that this would be an important topic to bring up because there uh, more and more, and I think it's always been the case, is that, of course, you don't get full funding from your government sources and your, I guess, official grants and uh, funding sources. So the temptation always is to go and try to raise money privately, you know, whether by selling shares in your company or um, getting loans from, from people, from investors, and so on. This has come up more and more, and I thought that it would be a good idea to you know, talk about the, um, the securities implications, like when you sell a security and what are the implications and uh, when do securities laws get engaged. And this is the interview with Jennifer Young that I recorded, I think, a couple weeks ago um, that uh, we'll be playing right after, right after we're done talking. And that's what the interview is about, is uh, being careful uh, when you're raising money and know that you do engage in, or you, you are caught under scope of securities laws and regulations if you are trading in quote-unquote securities, even though you're not like a publicly traded company or anything like that, but once you sell equity, uh, once you're selling debt in your company, then you are dealing in securities, and you have to be aware of that. And I suppose the the lesson in the end is to get the proper legal advice from someone who is knowledgeable in the field of uh, securities laws. And so uh, this is Jennifer Young, is uh, the person I interviewed. Uh, she is a partner at Bryan and Company. They're a law firm, a mid-size, uh, I think mid-size, um, almost mid-large size firm here in Edmonton. I've worked uh, with her on a, uh, a file, I guess a mutual client uh, before. And yeah, so I thought that she, uh, with her expertise in uh, securities, laws that she'd be a good person to interview and just talk a little bit about uh, securities regulations and the implications of uh, trying to rely on securities exemptions under national instrument 45106. So yeah, so that's uh, that's that's what the that's what the interview's about and it's probably about I think a 25 minute interview. Awesome. I'm excited to take a listen. Uh, I wasn't there for the interview, so I'm excited to hear what you guys all chatted about for that. I think it's time we need to do our, our legal disclaimer. Ah, of course, the disclaimer. All right. I can uh, read that disclaimer for us here. This podcast is for information purposes and entertainment purposes only. (laughs) We are not providing you with legal advice and nothing we say on this podcast should be construed as legal advice. If you require legal advice or counsel, please seek the services of a lawyer. And with that, uh, I guess we uh, need to plug our... Another yeah. exciting our sponsor. We have a we sponsor. We have a sponsor. <laughs> so it's really exciting. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. Special thank you to Jane Toogood, our audio editor. And you can find her on Instagram at JJ underscore two, and that's with two O's, good. And I just wanted to say, P.S., if you're, when you're listening to this, Jane, please feel better because she was feeling kind of sick. So I'm hoping that by the time she's listening to us and editing us that she's feeling a lot better. Yes, absolutely. Get well soon, Jane, uh, and, and speedy recovery. So, yeah, that, that's really exciting, uh, having Ampia on board. Uh, they're providing us. Uh, Ampia, if you're not familiar with that, uh, listeners, uh, it's the Alberta Media Production Industry Association. Uh, they, uh, by way of Dylan Pierce, are uh, providing us, and of course, uh, Jane Toogood is the our, our audio editor. Uh, they're editing our audio, so she has to listen to everything and cut out our ums and ahs. And <laughs> thank you, Jane. <laughs> and make us sa- and make us sound uh, really, really good. So thank you very much uh, to Ampia there. Uh, and with that, I suppose that uh, we'll just get right into it. Sure. So hope that you enjoy this interview, and if you have any uh, comments or feedback, uh, feel free to send them to us. That sounds great. Okay. See you next time.
Hi everyone, just before we get into our feature interview, I want to do a quick plug for our sponsor's upcoming event. Ampia, the Alberta Media Production Industries Association, will be holding its 45th annual Alberta Film and Television Awards Gala, known as the Rosies, on the evening of Saturday, April 27th at the Edmonton Convention Centre. My good friends and client, Mosaic Entertainment, has been nominated for 12 Rosies, so congratulations to them. This is very exciting for myself on a personal and professional level. For tickets and more information, please visit ampia.org. That's A-M-P-I-A dot org. Hope to see you there on April 27th. I am here today with Jennifer Young. She is a lawyer with Bryan & Company in Edmonton, Alberta, and we are here at the offices of Bryan & Company. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. You prefer Jennifer or Jen? Um, everybody calls me Jen except when they're mad at me, so let's go with Jen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I won't get mad at you okay, through this interview. Jen is a, in, uh, according to your profile here, you practice business law, corporate finance, and securities law. What else uh, can you tell us about yourself, Jen? Um, so I've been with Bryan and Company. I actually summered here after my first year of law school. I articled here, got called to the bar in 2008, and have been here since. I've been a partner since 2014. I have a pretty broad corporate commercial practice with a focus on mergers and acquisitions and securities law. So um, while I do pretty much all things that don't involve going to court, I find that probably about 80% of my time is tied up with working on mergers and acquisitions and securities. And when it relates to security specifically, it ranges from you know public company work to the owner-operated businesses, you know, simple incorporations, people issuing shares to their family members, you know, one-man sole proprietors, all the way up to the public company. So a pretty broad range of uh, securities work. Okay, excellent. And for the benefit of the audience, I let the audience know a little bit about what 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 is securities law generally? What is securities regulation? Yeah. So. It's interesting that you, you know, you frame it that way because I think a lot of people get themselves into trouble because they don't even appreciate what a security is. I think a lot of people are under the, you know, mistaken understanding that a security is only a share certificate or a unit certificate in a partnership and don't appreciate how many other things are actually caught under that ambit. There's also another misconception I think that's even more common is that securities laws only apply to public companies that are listed on a stock exchange. So they think of you know the TSX or somebody issuing shares on NASDAQ and they say, I'm a small mom and pop shop, that doesn't apply to me, I don't even have to think about that. Um, little do they realize that securities laws applies to any company, um, any issuer, whether incorporated or unincorporated, from the moment of formation and whether or not you're on a stock exchange. So this would include, you know, if you and I were to incorporate a company tomorrow and issue ourselves each one common voting share. Securities laws are in play. It just so happens that there are some exemptions that make it easier for people to operate in a simpler space. So they don't even realize that they've triggered securities laws um, to understand that there's some risk that they should be thinking about. So just going back to the broad definition of securities, um, things like options are securities. Things like promissory notes and debt instruments are securities. So sometimes people say, you know, I'm not issuing shares. I'm just raising money for my company, people are lending me money, I am giving them a bond of sorts, so I don't have to worry about any of this. And if you look at the very broad definition of what a security is in the securities legislation, it all of those things are captured. So then the question really comes down to, we know that we're within the realm of securities laws, what are the rules that are applicable to my specific circumstance that I need to make sure that I'm complying with? So, you know, who am I issuing shares to, in what jurisdictions, what kind of shares am I issuing, who am I raising them to, what do my marketing materials look like, all of those things need to be taken into consideration at the outset because I so often find that people come to us, unfortunately after they're already being audited um, by the Securities Commission or after they've had a complaint lodged with the Securities Commission or they're just have general investor backlash because they've made some promises on returns on investment that aren't coming to fruition. So now people are upset, are asking questions, might have called the Securities Commission, and now we're working backwards to try and figure out what went wrong. So um, securities laws kind of really apply to all things whenever you're raising money or issuing interest in companies or partnerships. All right, that's really interesting. And I think that 
a, a good majority of the populace does not know that. Yes. I mean, th these are one of those uh, areas of law that uh, at the outset looks very, very technical. And yes. it's like, okay, no, like you mentioned, no securities, not a public to trade company does not apply to me. So that is a perfect segue to talking mm -hmm. about what's relevant for, for this podcast is film producers. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a little bit of context or give our listeners a little bit of context, we had a mutual file. Uh, we can, of course, talk about the particulars mm -hmm. of, of that file where uh, the, the client wanted to raise money. Mm -hmm. And this is where the securities regulations kicked in and uh, where we had to rely on certain uh, uh, exempt status under National Instrument 45106. Mm -hmm. uh, just threw a lot, of, a lot of technical terms out there. But the scenario here is for Canadian media producers is that there is often not enough public funding, mm -hmm. you know, either grants or whatnot, to fully fund their productions. Mm -hmm. And it's happening more and more is that producers are going out and trying to raise private money, you know, whether by a couple of the ways you mentioned, uh, equity is a very common vehicle or loans, like private loans. So by way of, as you mentioned, promissory mm -hmm. note or something like that. So if I'm a producer, and speaking generally, of course, when not giving legal advice, mm -hmm. if I'm a producer, then keeping your definition in mind of, of security, uh, the, the definition of what is a security, what do I have to worry about for if I want to raise this private money by way of some kind of securities? So there's two fundamental principles in securities laws that I think is a starting point of any analysis. So there is a prospectus requirement under securities laws and there's also a registration requirement. So I'm going to probably gloss over the registration aspect I think for the purposes of the scenario that we're discussing because the registration aspect really comes into play when you're raising money not for a specific business purpose. So for example, if I were to hire you to raise money for me, you, as the person raising the money, aren't raising it for your business. So now you're in a dealer, broker type scenario, you're being compensated for selling securities. Then we get into the dealer registration realm where it's, you know, you have to be registered with the Securities Commission, you need to have certain, you know, know your client suitability assessments, things like that to make sure that you're marketing within certain rules, you're licensed, um, all of those rules are being met. That comes more into play when you're not raising money. Or for another example, sorry to back up, would be no if somebody was in the business of raising money for various things. So an investment fund would be a perfect example to say, this isn't for a specific film project, this is because I want to invest in various things. So I'm gonna go to the public and raise money, and then I'm gonna retain the discretion to you know, invest in projects of my fitting. So that's relevant because you're putting a level of trust in the person who is raising the money to use it for something that you don't know necessarily what that money is for. So that's the registration element. I think for the purposes of this discussion, the focus should be more on what the prospectus exemptions are. So there is a prospectus requirement under all Securities Acts in Canada that says you can't issue a security or trade in securities except under a prospectus. Um, and then, of course, we can talk about the exemptions, but I think most people are familiar with prospectuses in the sense that they all know of a company that's done an initial public offering, an IPO. They file this large, very large, very complicated, very expensive document with the Securities Commission. There's a very expensive process. I don't think most people, especially not people who are trying to raise money for a small film project, mm -hmm. are prepared to spend hundreds of thousands or even sometimes millions of dollars on an offering to raise $100,000 or $200,000. So then we get into the realm of what are the exemptions? So you, the starting point is you need a prospectus, but if you're not gonna do a prospectus, what is this list of exemptions that you could raise money, other avenues? So we get into the realm of prospectus exemptions. And you mentioned National Instrument 45106, and that is the regulation that has been adopted by the securities regulators of each jurisdiction of Canada that sets up what these money raising exemptions are, the prospectus exemptions. So some very common ones, would be the private issuer exemption, mm -hmm. the accredited investor exemption, the family, friends, and business associates exemption, um, the business consultant and employee exemption. There's an exemption, $150,000 exemption if you're raising you know, more than $150,000 from non-individuals. 
There's also an offering memorandum exemption, and now there's some new crowdfunding exemption. So those are some examples where you can raise money without a prospectus, but there's a bunch of requirements that you need to comply with in order to do that. So part of the exercise, and which is why it's useful for people to speak to a securities lawyer before they start raising money, is to say, what are my options here? So I've just listed a number of options. Who's my audience? Who are my potential investors? Where could I find an avenue to raise money? You know, so a perfect example would be the accredited investor exemption. Um, this is an exemption that is targeted at high net worth individuals or companies, um, with the rationale being these are sophisticated investors who don't need the benefit of a prospectus and that lengthy disclosure to be able to make an informed investment decision. Because of their level of sophistication, the presumption, the rationale behind the exemption is they're sophisticated enough that, and they have enough money that we don't need to protect them. So provided these people meet these certain net worth or income criteria, you can raise money from those people. That's an example. Another one is the Family, Friends and Business Associates exemption. You can raise money from a small group of people who are your family, friends and close business associates. The rationale being that these are people who know and trust you, probably have a good understanding of your business, your integrity, your track record, and because of that, they, again, don't need the benefit of that prospectus document. So the, the rationale behind most securities law is to protect the investing public. So the issue of full, true and plain disclosure is to make sure that people who are investing either get a prospectus, which lays out you know tons of financial information, tons of you know business plans and track records, or if they're not going to get that information, there's another avenue for them to get comfortable with the investment, whether it's by being sophisticated enough that they don't need that, they have a relationship with the issuer or somebody at the issuer. Okay, excellent. And just going over some of those, yeah. the accredited investor, I know there's a whole list of them under yes. uh, the definitions under 1.1 in uh, National Instrument 45106. Just for the benefit of the listeners here, uh, one of them would be you know, an individual who either alone or with a spouse beneficially owns financial assets, having an aggregate realizable value before taxes, but net of any related liabilities exceeds $1 million. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So we're talking about people who um, have a certain amount of financial assets, you know, um, have a certain amount of net worth. There's also an income test. So another one would be um, an individual who before taxes, their annual income exceeds $200,000 or combined with their spouse. Um, then there's you know a company that has over five million dollars in net assets. Um, you mentioned a few others. So again, going back to the the rationale behind this exemption is these people are sophisticated and have enough money that if they lose the money that they invest, presumably this isn't going to bankrupt people because really we're trying to make sure that people who are investing have the information to do so and aren't necessarily going to be you know investing themselves out of house and home if the investment doesn't work out because there are no guarantees. Um, when you're investing in any sort of project that you're going to get the return even with the best intention. So there's always a risk with these investments and these exemptions have been crafted around making sure that trying to protect people as best as you can, recognizing that there are no guarantees in investing. Okay. Now with the uh, the other category that you mentioned as an example, the family, friends and business associates category, I know that under uh, the national instrument is, is there's a whole list mm -hmm. of those types of relationships. but is, is there a, a neat summary way that you can maybe reiterate or explain? Yeah. Like, yeah what, what is this? Is it just is just my buddy that I go drinking with, or does it have to be blood family, or, or what? What uh, in general? What, what uh, would, would you uh, say about that? Yeah. So there is, like you said, that there's a discrete list. So when you look at family, friends, and business associates, it can be a director or officer or you know a control person of the company. So you work for a company that's raising money you're familiar with the company. So again, going back to the disclosure issue, you know enough about this company that you don't need the prospectus document to make an investment decision. That would be somebody who would fall within the family, friends and business associate exemption. Another person would be a family member and then they define a discrete list of family members. So it's not, you know, fourth cousins, twice removed. It's going to be spouses, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, children is the list that is currently provided for. And then I think what gets a little bit messier and where there's a little bit more room sometimes for potential breaches that people don't understand is the close personal friend or close business associate yes, definition. Yes, yes. And going back to, you know, is this my drinking buddy? <laughs> um, 
involved. So there is some guidance on this point. So what the securities regulators are trying to get away from is the circumstance where you say, you know, I, I'm in a curling club with these five guys and, you know, I see them once a week and we occasionally chat. Let's call them a close personal friend or close business associate so that I can raise money. That's that's casting the net far too broad. What the Securities Commissions are looking for is, you know, the length of relationship, the nature of the relationship, you know, the closeness, the history. So that's when it becomes really important for the, the issuer, the company raising the money, to document that relationship because the thing about these exemptions, which a lot of people run into, is there's no requirement at the outset to run this by the Securities Commission. You don't need to go to the Commission and say, I'm planning to raise, this is my list of ish, this is my list of investors, is this fine? You don't get that blessing. You only find out after the fact, potentially, that you might have cashed your net too broad because and you get audited by the Commission, let's say, and they come to you and say, what was the exemption you relied on? You say, oh, I relied on the um, family, friends, and business associate exemption, and then you provide them with the list, and the list is 200 people long. And they're <laughs> going to say, interesting that you have 200 close family, friends, and business associates. Where's the documentation describing that relationship? So as an issuer, I can't stress enough how important it is to document those things. Mm -hmm. To have, you know, whether it's a questionnaire or a representation form that says, investor A is the close family friend of this director. They have known each other for 15 years. They went to university together. They're in a book club together. They vacation together. Things like that that you might think is overkill. Those are the things that are going to really get you out of some hot water potentially when it comes time for an audit or when somebody's questioning whether or not you validly relied on that exemption. And again, this is because the relationship needs to be close enough for the purposes of securities regulations so that you're not just pitching strangers that there's this level of trust, as you as you mentioned, right? And it's not just that you're friends on Facebook uh, or Instagram buddies or something like that. And, you know, exactly. Just, <laughs> there's that kind of relationship. potential for people abusing relationships of, of course. quasi-trust, I guess. So you, there's been circumstances that I've read because the Securities Commission regularly publishes kind of their enforcement proceedings, and they'll say, you know, this person has been seized traded and has been sanctioned because they went to, for example, their church or their soccer club and made a broad pitch mm -hmm. to dozens or hundreds of people who they'd like to call their you know, family, friends, and business associates, kind of used that, that relationship and then you know, exploited it, for lack of a better word, or made it seem closer than it actually was. And that goes back to my comment on the number. And sometimes yes. that in and of itself will be enough to trigger um, an inquiry to say, you've relied on this exemption 500 times. Who has 500 close personal friends? So it just becomes really important to look at each investor you have on an individual basis and to make yourself comfortable as the company raising the money that you have an exemption to rely on because it's the buck ultimately stops with the company um, in terms of who's responsible for compliance. So when it, we go back to the accreditor investor exemption, for example, a lot of people or a lot of companies raising money will have a very simple representation letter in their, in their subscription agreement that says, check the box beside which one of these exemptions you're relying on. And somebody will say, yeah, sure, I make $200,000 a year, I'll check the box. The issuer you know, washes their hands of it, says, I've done my job, I'm compliant, doesn't look any further. The Securities Commissions have issued specific guidance saying that's not enough. You can't rely on a blanket representation letter, you need to go further, you need to inquire, maybe you need to see a T4, you know, mm -hmm. get some financial statements from the company when they're representing that they have $5 million in net assets and that's why they can invest, get something to back that up. You know, and then you run into some issues of privacy and document retention and all those things you'd have to think about, sure. but you need to be able to show that you've gone that extra step and substantiated your exemption. It's not enough for somebody to tell you that they fit within one of those. And I find that this is sometimes the tension between wanting to get that investment, being able to close the deal, so to speak, and requesting all this additional paperwork from your, perhaps your, your, your friend who is also maybe not close enough as a close mm -hmm. family friend or, or business associate, but they might meet some of these income tests. But the tension I mentioned is you want to close the deal. And it seems awkward that you want to request something like a T4 or some other financials to be able to back up this uh, proposed investor's income or, or, or the number of assets or the uh, amount of assets that they have. So I find that that's a bit of that tension 
that exists there. And I've heard comments of non-lawyers who are saying, well, can't we just simplify this? Because mm-hmm. this is going to slow down the closing because it's, it's onerous, right? Yes. And my response always to that is, um, yes, it's definitely onerous, but it's going to be a lot more onerous and unpleasant mm-hmm. if you don't do it and then on the back end of this you're being audited and sanctioned. And what I try and tell clients who are raising money is that there is a way, I like to think, to pitch to your potential investors what might seem to be an onerous process by telling them that as an issuer, as a company raising money, that you are committed to doing everything in compliance with securities laws. I think that goes a long way to give people a level of comfort in the company that they're investing in to say, this isn't a company that cuts corners. Yeah, this is a bit of a pain to go through all of this, but I also know that they're a company that takes compliance seriously. That also probably means that they're also doing a lot of other things right and by the book, and therefore I'm more comfortable writing a check for 50000 or $100,000 to a company right. that I know takes the law seriously. Of course, yeah, and that's, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Now, uh, well, we, we won't go too deep into it, but you, you talked about getting audited mm-hmm. uh, by the Securities Commission. What would trigger such an audit? One would be perhaps a complaint, and what else might trigger such an so audit? So complaints are going to be one of the surefire ways to get yourself audited, almost certainly, because um, securities regulation exists to protect the investing public by and large. So if, especially multiple complaints, you're almost certainly likely to get audited. If there's any concern that you're doing anything offside, and sometimes as an issuer, you're not even doing anything offside, which is why, just to kind of sidetrack a bit, why your marketing materials are so important, because oftentimes issuers overpromise or gloss over things, or people are investing without fully understanding, because that goes to the rush to raise the money and get the deal done. So sometimes people with the best intentions put a package in front of somebody and say, the deadline to invest is Thursday. Let's get this back to me as soon as possible. Whereas somebody who's writing a check for $100,000 probably should get some independent tax and legal advice, do some background homework on their own before that they invest. When that doesn't happen, you're just increasing the likelihood that somebody doesn't understand what they're getting into, maybe misunderstood you know, what the timeline for the investment was. I thought I was going to get my money back in two years. I didn't appreciate the expenses that were coming off the top. I didn't appreciate that there was no guarantees on my investment, all of those things. So you get people calling the Securities Commission and saying, I was lied to, you know, these crooks took my money. And so that's, like you said, one of the main ways that you're going to get. The Securities Commission also does, as part of their ongoing market reviews and compliance Um, projects, they will just do spot audits as well, Mm. or they will target sometimes specific industries where there have been a lot of complaints. So it was back in 2009, I believe, when they did a big amendment to the registration and dealer instruments and introduced a bunch of new rules. So shortly after that, they just did a lot of audits to see what the compliance rate was across industries. So people who had never even been on the Securities Commission radar were now on their radar just because they were just doing samplings all over the place to kind of check on compliance. So it's not a common thing, but it's always a risk. And I think that's, you know, when you're thinking of who you're raising money from too, that's why it's important to cast your net as narrow as you possibly need to and to be selective in who you're raising money from. Because if you have a relationship of trust with somebody um, at the outset, they're less likely to feel that you have been not forthright with them if they don't understand something. People who you've just met and now they've written you a check and they didn't get back the amount of money they thought that they were going to get, those are the kind of people who are going to make a fuss. And now in the age of social media and things like that, you have to worry about that too because the Securities Commission will monitor things like that. There will be message boards where people are saying, you know, this company had unsavory marketing practices and you know, I was lied to, and securities commissions will sometimes see that. That will come to their attention, and they'll just decide to do an audit. So, wow, wow, that's that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Well, amazing. Maybe yeah. that's not the right word, but <laughs> just a, a, a last question, and this is something that has come up with respect to securities law and fundraising. I'm only raising a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Why would the securities commission? They, they surely have bigger fish to fry than to come after little me and my project. Yeah. You know, how would you respond to something like that? 
So I would agree with the statement that there are likely always bigger fish to fry than that, but that is, I think, you know, the argument is tantamount to saying, but I only stole something that's worth $100. You know, go get, go after the guy with the grand theft auto. You're both breaking the law. You know, the, the energy that the commission puts into enforcing against the little guy versus the person who has raised millions and millions of dollars might be different, and you're likely to get on their radar much faster when you're raising more money, but that doesn't change the fact that the prospectus requirement exists for the issuance of all securities from the outset. So as soon as you understand that that's your starting point, there are these rules, it doesn't matter how much money right. you're raising, there is this framework that you need to comply with. And depending on who you're raising money from and how much money you're raising, it doesn't necessarily need to be that onerous. I think you know an important message to clients is, a lot of this sounds very technical, very scary, very expensive perhaps, yeah, you're going to spend some money on a lawyer, but you might not need to spend that much money at all because a lawyer might be able to tell you, you're a private issuer. As long as you only raise money from this small group of people, you don't have to prepare an offering document. There's no disclosure requirement. There's no reporting requirement. Just make sure you do these five things that your documents cover this, and you're probably fine. Okay. But you don't know that until you do the inquiry at the outset, whereas... You know, you're better off to spend a bit of money getting a little bit of advice on the front end to realize the framework that you're working in than realizing after the fact, even if it was only $100,000 that you raised, you raised it in breach of securities laws and now you're worrying about the potential audit and what the financial implications and reputational impacts of being sanctioned. And when you are sanctioned by the Securities Commission, it's public as well. So mm -hmm. from a reputational perspective, if you're trying to build a base of investors that you can go back to for future projects, you're setting a precedent, um, I think, in terms of compliance that you probably don't want to. We don't have enough time, but I would, I would love to dive into more about the definition of a private issuer under, mm -hmm. under the national instrument, but we don't have enough time for that. But in the end, then, if someone is looking to raise money by way of like a private uh, equity or uh, loans or something like that, then the first step is they should probably consult with a lawyer, a securities mm -hmm. lawyer, to see if what they're doing, what, what, are, what are their options, as you, as yeah. you mentioned, right? Yeah. yeah, I think it's safe to say if you're raising money, you're in the realm of securities regulations right. and law. It goes without saying that you're in that framework, but just to go back to my prior comment is it doesn't necessarily need to be complex. It right. can be extremely complex if you're, you know, you're raising money from hundreds of people and you want to do an offering memorandum, which is, a, you know, it's a, a smaller prospectus, for lack of a better word. It's a, it's a big disclosure document. You need audited financial statements. There's some very specific filing requirements. Those projects can be very expensive. But again, if you're dealing with a client who wants to raise, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars and they've identified five or six investors or even right. 20 investors, and they're people that clearly fit within one of these exemptions we've spoke about, it's really just a matter of you know, from a protecting yourself perspective, making sure that you've done the homework to investigate and validate that they actually fit within one of these exemptions, making sure that you have the, the paper if you ever get audited, making sure that you do any necessary filings with the commission. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jen. This is a, fa at least for me, is a very fascinating topic. I find it, it comes up uh, every now and then. And to know that there are experts like yourself in securities law that, uh, you can turn to that are out there uh, who can be hired for uh, su such uh, such kind of matters then it's it's very good to know so thank you for uh, your time and perhaps you could just tell our listeners where if uh, someone wants to get in contact with you how, how can they how can they find you yeah so we're um, Brian and Company LLP so we're at brianandco.com so easily found on a Google search I imagine and uh, yeah pretty easy to find so just we're when we have a large group of we have a you know a solid group of securities lawyers here who you know deal with all aspects of this so it's not just myself here we have a we have a big group here who's well versed in this stuff and it's it's an area of law that's constantly changing too so it's important that um, for people who have perhaps done this in the past they don't just dust off their old precedents perhaps and try right. and do it again without at least checking in with somebody to make sure that what they're still doing is current and compliant. 
Of course. Yeah, perfect. Like you said, if you think it's onerous now, you don't want to deal with the Securities Commission because that could be a lot more of a pain. And a lot more expensive the, yes, after absolutely. the fact to deal with it. So spend a little bit of money up front and get, get some advice and you're probably well on your way to raising some money. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again, Jen. Appreciate your time and uh, I hope you have a great evening.